Working towards non-attachment is the heart of the Buddhist path, but it may seem to you, it may seem to some of us, that uh, working towards non-attachment involves sort of caring less about uh, worldly concerns, about being more aloof from the world. And that's something, uh, this, this relation between non-attachment on the one hand and detachment on the other is going to be the subject of today's video, coming right up. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications of f uh, future videos that I post here on YouTube. And if you'd like a deeper dive into the Dharma of early Buddhism, uh, check out my courses over on the Online Dharma Institute. Non-attachment is perhaps the, the heart of the Buddhist path. Uh, this is something that uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi and others have said. But what is non-attachment? I think it's really important to get an, a, a, a clear idea of what it is that we're uh, aiming towards so that we don't aim in the wrong direction. Now, in what follows in this video, I'm going to be following to an extent uh, an essay, an online essay by Elizabeth Harris. I'll, live, I'll leave a a quote, or I should say a link to that uh, essay in the information box down below if you want to go and read the essay. But anyway, that's going to be some of the background here, and there's some other things as well down there if you're interested in reading more. Uh, so there are various related uh, uh, concepts in early Buddhism, and I'm going to be discussing early Buddhism in particular here in this uh, video. Uh, there are several related concepts in early Buddhism that are relevant to the, uh, the idea of non-attachment. There isn't really a single word that is easily translates to non-attachment in early Buddhism. There are several words that are sort of related. Now, one of these is nekama, or renunciation. Now, renunciation is a part of what right intention is. Right intention is the second part of the Eightfold Path, and it involves we, we make certain kinds of intentions, uh, uh, good intentions for our lives to make our lives better. One of those, uh, at least traditionally, is renunciation. And this involves our decision to uh, renounce certain aspects of our lives, to, to uh, count less, let's say, on certain aspects than others. Now, uh, we have to understand this is a middle path. Uh, right, right, uh, uh, right intention is a middle path between various options, and in particular, renunciation is, is going to be a middle path between sense indulgence on the one hand, that is to say, overdoing certain things in our senses, with our senses, and uh, extreme asceticism on the other, which also the Buddha was, was opposed to, because he didn't feel that that really led uh, towards wisdom. Now, we might consider a renunciation to be similar to the contemporary idea of minimalism in our lives. Some of us may be familiar with the uh, more contemporary modern idea of, of living a minimal life, minimalist lifestyle. There have been books and videos about this. I did a, a video about it myself a while back. I'll put a link up here on the screen in case you're interested in what minimalism is all about. But minimalism is essentially a kind of renunciation renouncing those parts of our lives that are less important. Uh, in other words, uh, being wise about paring down our lives to what, to what really is important and, and spending less of our time worried about uh, possessions and, and things that uh, simply clutter up our lives. Now, another aspect uh, that, that's similar to uh, non-attachment in the, in the broad sense has to do with uh, seclusion or withdrawal from life. And in early Buddhism, there are very various aspects to this seclusion or withdrawal. Uh, three in particular. The first aspect of seclusion or withdrawal involves physical seclusion. So uh, we may go on retreat for periods of time. That is to say, we may seclude ourselves from normal life to go off independently, uh, perhaps uh, by ourselves, or at least uh, preserving what's called uh, noble silence which is to say that we're not going to necessarily speak with people around us. In, in many Buddhist retreat centers, you may p pass a period of time, of, of days or whatever it might be, however long the retreat is, without speaking to other people, except in particular, perhaps, uh, 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 important parts, like, like you may spend time speaking to, let's say, the person who's leading the retreat in order to have a sort of a conversation or a, a dialogue with them about how your practice is going. But in general, 
you practice seclusion, physical seclusion. Uh, we can also seclude ourselves by, let's say, being off in a more rural atmosphere rather than being in the center of a city, which is one thing that the, that the Buddha seems to have been in favor of. Because being off in a, in a more quiet atmosphere lends itself more to, to meditation, it lends itself more to contemplation, rather than being caught up in the hurly-burly of, uh, say, social life. Now, another aspect that's related, the second aspect of this kind of withdrawal or seclusion, is mental withdrawal. And this involves uh, trying to withdraw ourselves from the unskillful or unhealthy kinds of mental states that obsess us. In particular, uh, these are known as, uh, or the most famous ones anyhow, uh, as the hindrances. There are five hindrances. And these are hindrances that um, make meditation more difficult. Uh, their uh, attachment or, 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 or interest in, in uh, 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 f pleasures, various kinds of, of sense pleasures. They are aspects of, of ill will, of anger, of hatred that comes up in our minds. They are involved uh, being uh, tired or sleepy. They can involve also having a, an overactive mind, a mind that is always worried or concerned, that's always flitting from the future to the past to try to figure out how to uh, undertake w ways of, of, of solving worries and concerns. Uh, these are all hindrances to effective meditation, and also doubt, doubt being the fifth. These are hindrances, and so insofar as we practice mental seclusion, we're trying to practice ways to get ourselves out of those, of those hindrances and other uh, similar kinds of uh, states, mental states, that are not very healthy for us. And the ultimate aim, uh, at least, of this kind of, of mental seclusion is to, is to get into deep kinds of meditative absorptions, which are called the jhanas. Now, the jhanas are a, a series of, of absorptive meditative states which are, which are pleasant in various respects. So that as we, uh, as we seclude ourselves from the world, and as we uh, spend more and more time in, med in deep meditation, we can reach deeper and deeper states which become pleasurable on their own. The, the third form of, of, of seclusion involves uh, what's called seclusion from all, basically from all uh, 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 difficult states, from all uh, sort of poisoned states of mind. And, and that is, of course, the ultimate uh, goal of the path, which is awakening. And that may be a kind of seclusion from all that's bad, as it were, all that's, all that's wrong in life. That can be a kind of seclusion which is really very far off for all of us, but at least it's this kind of seclusion that we can keep in mind. Now, there's another aspect of non-attachment, which goes by the word viraga in, in Pali, which basically means uh, a fading away of desires, a desirelessness, um, a, a lack of desires. And this is the kind of thing that we're sort of aiming towards, uh, a lack of desire in particular for uh, rebirth, uh, desire, a la uh, uh, sort of a drying up of our desire to be reborn in some uh, future life, that is part of the aim of practice, and indeed in one early sutta it's, it talks about how the practice that allows us to get towards desirelessness is the practice of mindfulness itself, which is really quite interesting. So by being mindful, by being uh, in a state where we are uh, become more and more openly aware of the state of our mind and our body, we become uh, more desireless. We, the, the desires that we saw that we thought we were so um, uh, invested in, if you like, uh, begin to dry up. They begin to uh, become less uh, forceful as time goes on, because we begin to see that those desires, when they're, when they're fulfilled within our ordinary life, they don't seem to actually uh, be so important. The, the fulfilling of these desires isn't so important. Another early Buddhist concept that is related to a non-attachment is anupadana, or uh, non-grasping, the, the, the sort of uh, drying up of our grasping for things, gra which is a very similar, or a very, very closely related concept in early Buddhism to non-attachment, the sort of modern, oh, I should say, uh, English term non-attachment. So as, we, as our uh, uh, grasping dries up, we, of course, become less attached to things. We become less invested in things. And there are traditionally uh, four attachments that we have in, in, in ordinary life. The first and perhaps most important for many of us is attachment to sense pleasures, attachment to objects, to, to beautiful things, to, to beautiful or uh, fantastic experiences that we have in life. 
we become very attached to our houses, to our cars, to particular objects that we have, uh, that we own, to particular pieces of land, let's say, or particular parts of the world. This is, uh, in, in essence, an attachment to sense pleasures. We can also um, have an attachment to, to views, and this is an extremely important one uh, for many of us who are more, shall we say, intellectual. For intellectual people, they tend, and, and even those of us who are not so intellectual, we can be very attached to particular viewpoints, uh, to particular things that we think are correct, and other things that we therefore think are incorrect. And uh, we can have such a belief without attachment. In other words, we can say, oh, okay, it's, it's right to do this, or wrong to do that, or uh, this is a correct viewpoint, without being there, thereby attached to it. Uh, because attachment involves a kind of a, an emotional welcoming, an emotional uh, sort of flutter of the heart when, when we hear something. And just as it might happen with sense pleasures, where we welcome these pleasures and relish them, and so as a result, uh, when they're taken away from us, we, we become despondent or depressed or angry, so too with views. Uh, we can uh, be so welcoming of a particular view that when somebody comes along who disagrees with us, we can, be, we be, can become angry, we can become uh, very averse to them because we have a different view. And this is called attachment to views, and it's just as problematic as our attachment to uh, sense pleasures. There's also our grasping at what's called a rules and rituals. That is to say, we may uh, become so invested in a particular set of rituals that we undertake, or rules, let's say, uh, most famously perhaps, the, the five precepts in, in, in Buddhism, uh, we become so attached to doing those properly that we become sort of holier than thou. We, we look down on other people. We, we think of them as part of who we are, as a, as, a, as a solid self. And that kind of attachment is equally problematic and, and pernicious, really, uh, because uh, we, it ends up that we sort of think that the aim of, of practice, the aim of the path, is to do certain kinds of rituals, to undertake certain kinds of uh, physical practices or, or not to undertake certain kinds of physical actions such as killing or stealing. And we sort of come to a, a feeling that, that by doing that we are thereby uh, expressing our better, our, 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 the sense in which we're better than other people, and that also can be a form of attachment. Uh, and finally, there is what we might say is the basic attachment, which is attachment to ourself. An attachment to a permanent uh, self, an attachment to a sort of a, perf a perfected self, an attachment towards a view of ourself as being a certain way. So we may think of ourselves as, as being uh, uh, better than others, uh, or, or perhaps as even being worse than others. There's ways of, of doing these kinds of invidious comparisons that where all of these kind of reify a notion of ourself. And uh, the, the central aim of practice, or one central aim of practice, is to begin to relax around this, this fundamental attachment to ourselves, which gets bound up in, in our viewpoints, and in who we think we are, and in, in our practices that we may think are, are better or worse than others. And I have an earlier video on five ways that we can uh, construct an idea of self, which you might find interesting in case you're not really uh, quite grasping how it is that we can that we can uh, attach ourselves to a self. Well, I have, again, this video talks about five different ways, among many others, that we can do this, that we can do just this. Now, so what I've gone through here are a number of ways, a number of concepts in early Buddhism that are related in, in, in closer or more distant ways to the ideal of non-attachment. Now, uh, there's a very, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is a, a wonderful translator and, and uh, philosopher, thinker, uh, monastic, uh, who talks about early Buddhism, translates the texts from early Buddhism, he said uh, a while back that uh, the supreme goal of Buddhism is the liberation of mind by non-clinging. The supreme goal of Buddhism. Now probably uh, my guess would be that Bhante Bodhi says this because of the third noble truth. The third noble truth saying that the cessation of suffering, of dukkha, of this existential kind of, of suffering, or this feeling that life is not quite right, life is not quite adequate, that this comes from the cessation of, uh, of clinging, of 
a tanha, which is the, the, the Pali word, which means thirst or, or craving, basically. Now, we can talk about either craving or clinging being the important uh, concept here, but they're, they're very closely related. Abhante Bodhi talks about uh, clinging, we can talk about craving, but the, the point is, is clear which is that the central goal is to release or relax around this kind of craving and clinging, to, rela uh, to relax or, or release this kind of attachment that we have to, to parts of the world or to views or to ourself. So we see that non-attachment, this, this modern term, this English term, is, is related to various ideas from early Buddhism about renunciation, about seclusion or withdrawal, about dispassion about non-clinging and non-craving and non-identification of ourselves with other things. So it's, it's a term that encompasses, I think, a number of related ideas from, from early Buddhism, from the early practices, that are absolutely central to the Buddhist path. Now here I want to get a little bit to detachment, because some people will use the word detachment for what I've just been discussing. Instead of saying non-attachment, they'll say detachment, that the supreme goal or some way of understanding the supreme goal of Buddhism is to become detached. And I think there is a, a very deep problem with this term in English because it has certain connotations. When we talk about being detached, we really, uh, at least part of the connotation of that word is that we're kind of aloof, that we're separating ourselves off from worldly concerns. We're just sort of uh, not caring about the world. We're not caring about other people. We're keeping ourselves, again, the word would be aloof from the world. And this is not an accurate uh, reflection of early Buddhist belief or practice. In particular, we can think of early Buddhist practices of the, the Brahma-viharas. Brahma-viharas are, are four practices, related practices, around uh, fostering and increasing our, uh, our sense of, of kindness towards others our compassion for the world, our, uh, our sympathetic joy, our ability to have joy in the success of others, and our equanimity, our ability to uh, hold the world without, without preferences for certain people over others, but to, to hold everyone in this kind of generalized kindness and compassion and, and sympathetic joy. This is a, a very fundamental practice in the early tradition, indeed all of Buddhism. Uh, there are all other practices such as, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the five uh, precepts where uh, we undertake these precepts uh, of not killing, of not stealing, not lying, and so on. We undertake these precepts out of compassion for others because we don't want to harm others as much as possible. We want to minimize our tendency to harm out of compassion for others. There also is a, a famous sutta in the, in the Digha Nikaya that talks about a, a wheel-turning monarch, that is to say, that gives us a, a picture of what uh, life would be like under a sort of an idealized kind of Buddhist monarch. And we have to understand that this is uh, quite a long time ago, many millennia in the past, so it's not going to be an idea of a, a government that may necessarily be to our modern standards, but nevertheless the idea is that this perfect monarch, this perfect ruler, is going to be somebody who undertakes to minimize the amount of injustice in their, in their state or country where they, where they rule. That, that the idea of injustice being a problem, and so if the, if the monarch is not undertaking a proper ruling, that they are therefore going to be creating more injustice, and that's a bad thing. So what this implies is that uh, a rulership under a kind of a perfected kind of Buddhist ruler would be one where, where uh, injustices are minimized. And I, I would submit that all of these kind of concepts from early Buddhism are, are concepts that are not compatible with an ideal of detachment, that somehow if we, uh, if we aim towards a, a kind of perfected state that we're going to be, become more and more detached from the world and, and care less and less about the world. That simply isn't compatible with these kinds of practices. There's also a, a very uh, wonderful and, and somewhat famous early sutta where, uh, I believe it's in the Vinaya actually, where the, the Buddha uh, uh, confronts a, a, a number of monks who are in the same hut. The, the monks would stay in a hut together, several in the same hut, and there's one of the monastics in that hut, one of the monks, who is very ill. And in fact, the Buddha finds this monastic uh, lying in a pool of his own excrement because he is, he is so ill. And the Buddha confronts the other monastics who are in that hut with him, who are 
cohabiting and asks how it is that they have allowed this to happen. And the other monastics are basically detached. They're aloof. They, they say, well, we have no, he has no interest for, uh, for us, and uh, he's not able to help us, we're not able to practice together, so we just left him be. And the Buddha gets really quite angry and stern with them, at least stern, um, saying that, uh, basically, whoever would attend me, whoever of you would attend me if I were in that situation, you should also attend the other monastics, you should attend this other person. So the Buddha undertakes to clean the monastic off, to, to put him in a much more comfortable uh, position and state, um, so, so as to be uh, an example, to say, you know, this is the way you should behave with your, with your brothers and sisters, with your brother and sister monastics because there's nobody else around here to be compassionate towards you. We, we live together in a communi community, so we must do that for each other. And again, this is exactly where, uh, an example where the Buddha is, in fact, against this kind of, uh, of aloofness or a detachment from the world, in the, world, in the word detachment. Uh, also, it's said uh, in another sutta in the early texts that uh, an arahant, that is, an awakened person, is simply incapable of violating the precepts. They're incapable of killing another person or another, another being. They're incapable of lying or of stealing or committing sexual misconduct. They're simply incapable of these things because the, the, the ethical uh, strictures, the ethical reasoning, the, the, uh, the, the, the wish to be kind and compassionate to others is so ingrained in them that they are simply unable to do otherwise. And this again is an example of where detachment is the wrong concept. So when we say that the Buddha was interested in, or the final goal, the ultimate goal of Buddhism is a goal of non-attachment, we have to be very careful that non-attachment, of course it has a far enemy in attachment, we don't want that, we're trying to get away from attachment, but it also has what's called a near enemy. And the near enemy, this concept that's somewhat close but actually uh, an enemy, is the concept of detachment. Detachment is also something that we want to get away from. And we'll find in the early suttas that the Buddha actually uh, was uh, very, I think, uh, interested in arguing against detachment, in arguing against being aloof, in, argu in saying in certain situations that um, people should, let's say, stand up against harassment that's occurring in front of them. They shouldn't simply be aloof, that they should stand up and criticize those who are worthy of criticism. And also, of course, uh, praise those who are worthy of praise, rather than standing back aloof in some kind of misguided understanding of what it is to be equanimous, thinking that that's being equanimous in the Buddha's understanding. It's not. And I actually did an earlier video about just this, this point, which I have, I'll put up a link here on the screen in case you're interested in hearing more about the ways that we should strive to be uh, less aloof. So I hope that this has been useful. I hope we'll catch you on the next one of these videos. And meanwhile, all of you be well.